Hi, welcome to our worship for today. My name is Melissa McDade, and I'm the pastor at St. Paul in Norrisville United Methodist Churches, and I'm glad that you're worshiping with us this day. Today, we're worshiping for the fifth Sunday in Epiphany. Um, next week is Transfiguration Sunday, and then after that, Lent begins. So I'll give you information about our Community Ash Wednesday service um, in a few more days when we get everything firmed up. And that will be online as well, of course. I have a couple of announcements um, to start with. Um, one, this is Communion Sunday. Um, so if you want to grab some communion elements uh, to be blessed virtually, um, some juice or even water, if that's what you have, some bread or some crackers, um, and through at, at the end of the service, um, we will be celebrating communion together. A couple of announcements um, for the community include, I mentioned this last week, um, Upper Chesapeake is having a diabetes prevention a clinic, workshop, a Zoom kind of thing, um, and uh, they always do great programs. You can look at their website to get more information, um, or you can um, email me and I'll send you the information that they sent me. A couple of other things, as I mentioned last week, this is the time of year where we do a couple of very simple mission projects, and yet they are very meaningful. Um, Sunday is the Super Bowl, as many of you already know, um, and that's the day we um, uh, celebrate Super Sunday, which was a tradition started by a youth group in North Carolina many, many years ago. And um, it's to bring $1 and one can of soup um, to worship with you, and then we donate that to our local food banks. So this year, um, because everything is different, um, you can drop off your um, cans of uh, food at church, as I've mentioned before. However, the boxes that we use are kind of snowed in right now. So an alternative to our al alternative would be to either have me pick it up um, or I can meet you someplace and uh, we can get those cans of soup that way, or it, uh, which would be a lot easier if you send um, uh, in with your offering some extra money and mark that for Super Sunday. Um, and, and please make it more than a dollar because you know the need is very great this year. Um, and uh, um, our food banks are kind of working overtime to help folks in our community and beyond um, during this pandemic. The other thing that we do this time of year um, it entails uh, Valentine's. Uh, we do $5 gift card Valentine's for the folks um, who are homeless um, in Edgewood. We work with New Hope Fellowship, which is a United Methodist Church there in Edgewood, and, um, and they provide lunch and all kinds of things that folks need um, when they're um, when they're homeless um, uh, for the time being. So most of those folks are housed right now in motels um, since the pandemic started, which is wonderful. However, they still have needs. Um, and Miss Jackie, who runs the program at New Hope, um, I give her the gift cards and she disperses them as they're needed um, to folks, whether they need um, you know, new socks or, um, you know, cough drops or Band-Aids or something like that. So um, uh, they come in handy. So, um, and also um, you can just, um, you can buy some gift cards for me um, and get them to me um, either by dropping them off at church. I wouldn't advise putting them in the, um, the bag, the boxes outside, but if you have a church key, you can leave them in church. Or again, you can let me know and I can make arrangements to meet you someplace or pick them up at your, um, on your porch. <clears throat> For the call to worship, um, I want to share something written by um, a preacher and writer named Martha Spong, and um, it's called, uh, um, uh, They Removed the Roof, and it's about the gospel lesson that we're going to read in a few moments. They carried their friend on a stretcher, their paralyzed friend, and because the crowds were so enormous, they took him to the roof of the house and removed the roof and dug through it and lowered him into the middle of the room where Jesus was. Sometimes I wish someone would do this for me and put me right in the middle of it with Jesus, put me right in front of his face and make it so he will look me in the eye and see me and fix what is wrong with me. And I'm not sure whether he would offer to heal me. My toe joints are pretty bad right now. Or forgive my sins, and they're pretty bad right now, too. But I know I would take either. 
And sometimes I realize that's exactly what we're doing for each other, friends. When we pray for one another, we see the crowded situation around Jesus and we find a way to get to the top of the house and remove the roof and dig through it. And we put our friend in need right where they need to be in front of Jesus. Thank you for doing that for me. I'm glad to do it for you too. And I have to echo Martha's words uh, personally. Thank you for doing that for me. And I'm glad to do it for you as well. Let us pray. Creative God, from whom new possibilities spring, we call upon your name. Make a way for us where there has been no way. Open windows where doors have been closed. Quench the drought of our spirits with living water that we may sing your praise. When we are paralyzed by our fears, carry us into your presence. Free us to welcome your newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes to us from Mark's gospel in the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. This is one of those wonderful stories that I love so much. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up. Take your mat and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Here ends the reading of our scripture for today. May God add understanding to all of us. For my young friends, I thought and thought about what... Um, uh, what book that I have might um, address this issue? And I came up with one of my new favorites. And I've read this to um, uh, my friends before in church, but it's called Extra Yarn. And it's by Mac Barnett. And um, I just have fun with this book. So, um, and I think it's about, um, about a miracle. And also about how sometimes there are folks that don't like the miracle. And that reminded me of the scribes in this story who were suspicious of what Jesus was doing. Okay, so the pictures start out black and white, but you'll see the color come in a few minutes. On a cold afternoon in a cold little town where everyone you, everywhere you looked was either the white of snow or the black of soot from chimneys, Annabelle found a box filled with yarn of every color. So she went home and she knit herself a sweater. See the color now? And when Annabelle was done, she had some extra yarn. So she knit a sweater for Mars too. Mars is her little dog. But there was still extra yarn. And when Annabelle and Mars went for a walk, Nate pointed and laughed and said, you two look ridiculous. You're just jealous, said Annabelle. No, I'm not, said Nate. But it turned out he was. And even after she made a sweater for Nate and his dog and for herself and Mars, she still had extra yarn. At school, Annabelle's classmates could not stop talking about her sweater. Quiet, shouted Mr. Norman. 
quiet everyone. Annabelle, that sweater of yours is a terrible distraction. I cannot teach with everyone turning around to look at you. Well, then I'll knit one for everyone, Annabelle said, so they won't have to turn around. Impossible, said Mr. Norman. You can't. Oh, but it turned out she did. Look at her whole class now, even for Mr. Norman. And when she was done, Annabelle still had extra yarn. So she knit sweaters for her mom and dad and for Mr. Pendleton and Mrs. Pendleton and for Dr. Palmer and for little Lewis. She made sweaters for everyone except Mr. Crabtree, who never wore sweaters or even long pants and who would stand in his shorts with the snow up to his knees. No sweater for me, thanks, said Mr. Crabtree. So she made Mr. Crabtree a hat. And even then, Annabelle still had extra yarn. She made sweaters for all the dogs and all the cats and for the other animals too. You know, the bear in the sweater. Soon, people thought, soon Annabelle will run out of yarn. But it turned out she didn't. So Annabelle made sweaters for things that didn't even wear sweaters. The mailbox and the birdhouse. And even the house. All the houses in town and the churches too. Things began to change in that little town. News spread of this remarkable girl who never ran out of yarn. And people came to visit from all around the world to see all the sweaters and shake Annabelle's hand. One day an archduke who was very fond of clothes, sailed across the sea and demanded to see Annabelle. Little girl, said the Archduke, I would like to buy that miraculous box of yarn and I'm willing to offer you one million dollars. Notice that she knitted a sweater for the Jeep here. No, thank you, said Annabelle, who oh, was knitting a sweater for a pickup truck. Excuse me, it wasn't a Jeep, it's a pickup. It's hard to tell when they have sweaters on. The Archduke's mustache twitched. Two million, he said. Annabelle shook her head, no thanks. Ten million, shouted the Archduke. Take it or leave it. Leave it, said Annabelle. I won't sell the yarn. And she didn't. So that night, the Archduke hired three robbers to break into Annabelle's house. And they stole the box. And they took it to the Archduke, who set off across the snow and sailed over the sea. Back to his castle. The Archduke put on his favorite song and sat in his best chair, and then he took out the box, and he lifted its lid, and he looked inside. It's empty. His mustache quivered. It shivered. It trembled. The Archduke hurled the box out of the window and shouted, Little girl, I curse you with my family's curse. You will never be happy again. But... And you see the little box of yarn, or not yarn, empty box of yarn, floating on a piece of ice across the sea. <gasps> and wouldn't you know it, it floats right up to where Annabelle and her dog are sitting. And she picks up the box. And she turned out. And, and it says, it turned out she was. The end. So it was a miracle, just like Jesus healing the man who couldn't walk and the Pharisees who didn't like it very much. Let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mark sets this miracle early in the ministry of Jesus, but not so early that no one knows who Jesus is yet. As we talked last week, chapter one of Mark's gospel is packed full of the beginning of Jesus's ministry. He's already called some disciples and done a few miracles and news does get around. So as Jesus gets back to Capernaum, he's back at Peter's house with a standing room only crowd. At least most biblical scholars think it's Peter's house that Mark calls home in this part of the story. 
And even with a shoehorn, if you remember what they are, you couldn't squeeze anybody else in. It was jam-packed. People pressing in against each other. No social distancing there. And frankly, houses weren't made for crowds like that. It was Pete, if it was Peter's house, it would have been a simple fisherman's house, not some sprawling McMansion. It wouldn't have been very big at all. It was one story, made of clay. It had a set of steps that went up alongside the house to go to the roof. Um, that was to escape the heat of the day by reclining on the rooftop in the evenings when temperatures started to cool down. And typically, large extended families lived together in these small quarters. Um, some were adjacent to one another for as families grew and grew. So, so that was another reason to sleep on the roof, to get some peace and quiet. And they were usually thatched roofs um, held together with mud and wood beams or branches um, that made the structural part of the roof. I even read that sometimes the branches were meant to be lifted off, removed, to allow the hot, humid air escape from the inside of the house, to cool it off for everyone. One thing I read this week said that the house was packed tighter than a hippo in skinny jeans. Now that's a mental image for you. Inside the house with Jesus were the big shots, some of the, uh, some of the teachers of the law, um, the scribes. Um, who wanted to hear what Jesus had to say for themselves. They wanted to know, was he the real deal or was he a heretic? Already this early on, the scribes didn't trust Jesus. They already knew that Jesus was teaching something new and different, and they didn't like that one little bit. Be but they were big shots, so they got the best seats in the house, which meant they were close up. Frankly, because no one else wanted to be near them, hmm? um, they thought they were better than regular people. Well, a crowd came and they squeezed in all right to the point that even the door was blocked with this mass of humanity. And if anybody showed up late, well, good luck finding a place to stand and see and hear. But sure enough, five latecomers arrive. These four men and their paralyzed friend. They're carrying him on a makeshift stretcher, each one holding one corner, toting their friend down the road, trying to stay in step with one another. It must have been a bumpy ride for the paralyzed friend, but they were determined to get their friend to see Jesus. And then as they turned the corner, they could see the crowd beat them there, and they stopped in their tracks. Oh no, what's going on? They must have thought the paralytic strains to see what's going on from his vantage point, which wasn't a very good one. They pushed their way to the corner um, closer, trying to make their way through the crowd, but it's useless with all the people pushing forward. They have to step back and reconsider. They set their friend on the ground gently while they rub their aching backs and consider their options. We'll never get through that crowd, one of them says. Another says we'll never get to see Jesus. And another says we can't give up. There must be another way. And the fourth says, I have an idea. The steps, let's use the steps. If we can get him up on the roof, then we can drop him down at Jesus' feet. What? Are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? We could get in trouble for that kind of vandalism. But the man was committed to his harebrained scheme. I'm not coming um, this far to give up, he said. If we get him through the roof, we'll pull our money and fix what we've broken. I'm telling you, it's the only way that will work. The paralytic just didn't want to make a fuss. Please take me home, he implored. But obstacles often prove to give way to opportunities. So his friends ignore him, frankly, and they push aside the crowd, stepping on a few toes and make it to the steps. People were sitting on the first two or three steps, but after that, they were clear. So up to the roof they went. And it wasn't easy. Have you ever tried to carry a makeshift stretcher up a set of stairs? Or how about a sofa or a dresser? It's not easy to keep the load balanced. The two guys on the higher steps had to keep their end of the stretcher lower, and the guys on the lower end of the steps had to hold their end higher. 
and the paralytic, already aware that he was something of a spectacle by virtue of his handicap, closed his eyes in embarrassment and prayed that they wouldn't drop him or he wouldn't roll off the edge. Huffing and puffing, they made it to the top, wiping their brows and shaking out their arms. One puts his ear to the roof to pinpoint, as best he could, where Jesus was standing by the sound of his voice. He points to the spot, and they start digging. They have to break up the clay coating, dig out the brushwood, the branches beneath, and stuff their friend, Matt and all, through the three-foot space between the beams. And they lowered him hand over hand until he was at the feet of Jesus. It got the attention of everyone in the house. First the digging noise, then falling clay and brush, people dodging as best they could in the crowded space below, and then this bright beam of light shining through, highlighting the dust in the air and the silhouette sliding down. Every eye looked up at the ceiling. They followed the man down while three or four of them below reached up to steady his decline all the way to the floor. And every eye looked back up at the four grinning faces peering down through the hole in the roof. Mission accomplished. One scholar says Mark measures faith not by its orthodoxy, but by its determination, courage, and persistence. Those four friends had faith, to be sure. And then Jesus looks down at his feet and says to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. That statement did more than shock the teachers of the law in the crowd that day. It must have shocked those four friends too. Your sins are forgiven. We didn't come all this way, drag him all this far, lug him up here to the top of this house, tear a patch in a stranger's roof, and drop him down to your feet, Jesus, to get his sins forgiven. We brought him to get his body healed. So what's this with your sins are forgiven stuff? I don't blame him for feeling that way. How would you feel if you fell off a ladder and at the hospital, the doctor in the ER cubicle says, your sins are forgiven, now you can go home. Or if you go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription and the pharmacist, instead of giving you your medication, says, your sins are forgiven now. Go home and you'll be fine. It was pretty confusing to the friends who had gone to all that trouble. But these words just made those scribes see red. And Jesus knew it. Unwanted and unexpected visitors were often treated like an inconvenience instead of with hospitality and opportunity. They didn't speak up, the scribes didn't, not here, not now, but if they had those cartoon speech bubbles coming out of their heads, we would be reading, who does this guy think he is, this Jesus guy? Only God can forgive sins. They were not pleased at all with the way Jesus handled this intrusion. But Jesus doesn't miss a beat. It was no intrusion for him. He took their silent challenge and asked them a question. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and take your mat and walk? The scribes turned red and looked down at their own feet. Unless we really think about it, we might just keep going on in this story. But when you think about it, you realize that at this moment, Jesus is confronting the injustices that this man faced every single day by the people around him. Being disabled, this man surely lived in poverty. He relied on the handouts of others. There was no good system for caring for the poor. Sure, there were religious laws to care for the poor and indigent, and many faithful people did what they could, but too often the rich looked down upon the poor and kept on going. And the rules were made to take advantage of them. Sounds a little like today, doesn't it? There was no health care system at all. Add to that, to be a full member of the Jewish community, you had to be physically whole as defined by the law, by the Torah. 
You couldn't be blind or lame or a leper or have an, a mental illness to participate in the religious traditions of the day. That's because they assumed if there was something wrong with you, you had sinned in some way, or your parents had, or someone close to you had, because that was, after all, what must cause sickness, so they thought. And the scribes were actually right. Only God can forgive sins. They knew those laws inside and out, and what Jesus was doing was really blasphemous from their perspective. But perhaps this story is Mark's way of showing right up front who is really in authority. As you read through the Gospels, you find that most of the people Jesus healed were from those banned categories. It was sometimes called the debt system. Um, through forgiveness and healing, Jesus challenged that debt system, which held people outside the community. By Jesus offering this language of forgiving sins right up front in Mark's gospel, he's challenging the oppressive system that kept people out of the temple and out of their own faith. Jesus releases him from this debt and places him squarely back into the community. He owes nothing anymore. And that's where the rub is with the establishment if Jesus had cured these people, let them go their merry way, refraining from forgiving their debts, their sins, and restoring their whole selves, there would have been a little clash with those in power. But their power was based on that debt system. So Jesus took it a lot farther than forgiving, than healing their bodies. Like I said last week, he didn't come just to be a miracle worker healing droves of people who lined up at his door. He told his disciples, we need to go to the neighboring towns. We need to move on beyond this to reach even more people, to do even more work. Jesus tore down the dividers between those who claimed the law was hard and fast and exclusive and those who stood for whatever reason outside the law. The roof came down and Jesus taught people a new vision. Back to our story. And then Jesus tells the man just lowered through the roof to get up, take his mat, and go home. Then this twisted pretzel of a man, still covered with dust and dried leaves, straightened up like a soldier in attention and grabbed his mat and marched right out of the place in full view of everyone there. And the same crowd who wouldn't make way for him to get in the house when he was paralyzed now made a clear path for him as he walked out the door. Meanwhile, his four friends on the roof were still high-fiving each other, shaking their heads in amazement and laughing out loud at the healing of their friend and the power of this Nazarene named Jesus. At least one of them muttered under his breath, thank God we don't have to carry him home. I love this story. I love making it come to life. And maybe you've heard it before. I hope you have. Often when it's preached, we talk about how those friends brought their friend to Jesus. And that's what we should be doing, carrying our friends to Jesus. Preacher and writer Martha Spong, whose um, uh, call to worship I used, tells a story about a time when she was lowered through a roof. She says a group of friends helped her through a time of difficulty, of emotional paralysis. She had postpartum depression so severe that she spent almost a week in the hospital. And when she got home, she was flat and sad and not sure how she would manage to take care of her three little children. She knew she needed help, but she didn't have the wherewithal to figure out what that could be exactly. Then the women of her church study group decided that in addition to bringing her family dinner uh, for several weeks, they would pay someone to come, someone she knew to come and clean her house. When one of them called to tell her, she just cried. There was such a, it was such a kind gesture, but the house was a wreck and she was well-trained. Even at her lowest point, she knew you had to pick up the house before you let somebody else clean it. She didn't see how she could do that herself. The task was beyond her. 
Her friend on the phone said, don't worry, I'll come and pick up the house with you. So with each toy they put away, each stray sock they placed in the hamper, each piece of laundry that was uh, folded and placed in a dresser drawer, Martha felt a little better and she moved a little bit more easily. She concludes, we have the power to do this for each other, to do this for our friends, to do this by being friends to, to one another. That's what friends are for. And that makes a wonderful sermon. It's an important thing for us to do, bring others to Jesus, even when we have to tear through a mess to do it. But there are other ways to work on this passage too. Maybe you've heard some sermons on the barriers that keep us from Jesus, like paralysis, like crowds, like leaders in the church, even physical barriers like roofs that get in our way. Or maybe you've heard that this is a story about the great lengths God goes to to get outsiders into our churches and how Jesus challenges our roadblocks. But today, I want you to hear the story of how these creative folks found a way to dig a big hole in someone's roof. The paralyzed man was made whole and the scribes had their theological feathers ruffled. God was doing a new thing among them. And it was about healing and forgiveness. Everyone, every one of us needs healing. And we are diggers who make an opening for an encounter with God. Sometimes we have to dig through racism and prejudice. Sometimes we have to dig through long-standing traditions or the way we've always done things. Sometimes we have to dig past other people's opinions or fear of trying something new. Those friends were an example of taking the love of others to the next level. They could have stayed friends with the paralytic and treated him with sympathy and love for the rest of his life. But they took that love to the next level. They were no longer passive, except expecting someone else to do something or just accepting it with the way it was. They decided to do whatever it took. They um, overcame every obstacle that stood in their way, pushing through the discouragement, pressing through the crowd, looking for alternative ways when the direct route was unavailable, risking their treasure and the goodwill of others by tearing a hole in a complete stranger's roof. They were bold and creative and unashamed, and they overcame those obstacles. They took love of those who need Jesus to the next level. And that's what we need to do. This pandemic has been a time for us to sit back and think, my friends, at least it has been for me. I wonder what our church will be like when we're able to get back together, not just for worship, because most of you know that worship is just a small part of what we do as a church. I think it will be time for us to break through some barriers, stir up some dust, fight for the healing and the wholeness of those in need, and risk doing something that no one has thought of before, and not be afraid that a few people won't be happy with our decisions. Let us pray. Oh God, may we be like the paralytic's friends and dig through those obstacles that keep us and others from you. May we find ways to be true healers. May we be open to the new ways the kingdom is moving through walls and roofs and buildings and communities. May we have the deep faith of the paralytic, ready to be shifted and jostled and carried by forces not our own in our journey toward wholeness. May we be like the crowd looking on that day, open to and ready to recognize your kingdom among us. May we be like the scribes who care deeply for our tradition, yet may we reject traditionalism, realizing that you never want us to stay the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the time where we 
often share our prayer concerns and our joys and our thanksgivings when we're together in worship. Um, if you have any prayer concerns, please call me or email me and let me know. And, um, and if you want, I can pass it on to everyone else so that we'll all be praying together. Um, for now, um, I'll just remind you that um, um, Wiley had a, um, a, a valve uh, replacement in his heart this week. Turns out to be a cow valve. Um, and he's a dairy farmer, so it fit very well. Um, I don't know if he knew the cow or not, but I'm suspecting he might have. Um, he's doing very well. Keep him in your prayers. Um, Carl um, is in the hospital, had some heart issues this week. They thought maybe a pacemaker might work. However, the, today they decided they would um, treat it with medication. So they're changing his medication and watching him for a couple of days to make sure that works before he comes home again. So um, keep him in your prayers as well. Um, Angeline um, is... Um, uh, you know, I don't. I just don't even know what to say. Hardly. So, um, after they removed the brain tumor this week, they told her that she has stage four colon cancer. Um, the cancer actually started in the colon, um, was missed by a couple of doctors, um, spread to her lungs and also to her brain. Um, and and she and her family are just trying to decide what's the best move to make next. Um, and it's certainly a very difficult time. So please keep them all in prayer. Um, Tom's sister Maggie has a neighbor named Doug, um, and we've met Doug before. He's been to the barbecues at Norrisville and the festivals at St. Paul, um, and he's having quite a few neurological problems of the last few months, and they can't seem to put their finger on what it is. It comes and goes. Um, so um, it's been a real difficult time for he, for him and his wife um, and all who care about him. So please keep Doug in your prayers as well. Um, and I know there are many others. Um, I just try to keep it short and sweet um, when we're virtual. Um, but, uh, but again, if you have more, I can um, certainly share those uh, via our email chain. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have blessed us in so many ways, even during this difficult time, by giving us friends to help carry us, um, by giving us Jesus to teach us, by giving us ideas to transform our lives, like breaking through roofs, like the least shall be the greatest, like a small little seed can grow into amazing things. Keep giving us those ideas, Lord. Keep us thinking outside the box of the way that we have always done things. Keep breaking open those things that hold us back in our lives. And now stretch us, Lord. Help us to pray for those that we don't know, for those that we don't like, for those who are not like us, help us to carry the mat for those in need. Hear us as we pray for families everywhere struggling during this pandemic because of illness or isolation, because of stress or turmoil. We pray for those struggling financially because of this pandemic, for those who are sick, for those who have lost loved ones, for our frontline and essential workers still struggling after nearly a year in this crisis. We pray for the people of Myanmar, suddenly finding the military has staged a coup against their own government. We pray for the unsettled countries in East Africa, for the violence against women increasing in Afghanistan, for the people of Bolivia as COVID runs rampant and the government refuses to help, for the people in South Africa who are going to bed hungry as a result of the economic fallout of the pandemic. And we pray for those that we know and love too. Hear our prayers in the name of the one who wasn't disturbed one little bit by the roof crashing in on him, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now would be our time for offering. So I'd just like to give my usual reminder that you can go to our website, norrisvillechurch.com and find addresses for both Norrisville and St. Paul United Methodist Churches. Um, Norrisville has a PayPal button too, if that's helpful. Um, and uh, you can help us um, with our special missions, like I mentioned at the beginning of the service, um, and our regular missions as well, as uh, we keep the doors of the church um, 
not open all the time, but yet in ministry. Um, one of the things I was just talking to my husband, Tom, about is that our um, ministry of uh, medical equipment has just expanded. And each week, um, there's someone who needs something um, that usually we have, um, or someone who's donating something. Um, if you know of someone that has um, a wheelchair, especially a lightweight wheelchair or a transport chair um, sitting in their basement or garage not being used, please um, try to get it for us um, because we use those often. Um, folks need those a lot. Um, if um, we have lots of walkers, um, uh, we also have um, um, potty seats and shower chairs um, and a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, crutches and whatnot, um, that if you, um, if you need something or know somebody who needs it, uh, please let us know because um, we'd love to share. Um, that's one of our ministries that we, uh, that we share with our community and beyond. And thank you all for all your support um, for this almost a year now um, in this difficult time. And now, as I said earlier, um, get your elements for communion ready. If you haven't done that yet, you maybe might be able to pause us um, and uh, go grab those things, um, some some bread and some some juice, perhaps, or whatever you have that would uh, that would work at this time. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to our Lord. Let us give thanks to God, our creator. With joy, we give our thanks and praise. Before anything was created, you were God. You spoke into the darkness and called forth light. By your word, you called order and beauty out of chaos. You created us out of ordinary dust claimed us as beloved children, made in your image, and breathed into us the breath of life. You delivered us from captivity and made a visible path through the waters, making a way where there was no way, sending nourishment where none could be seen, and leading us through the wilderness so that we could unlearn the ways of injustice and oppression. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When we needed reminders of your love, your grace, your truth, your desire for justice, you have sent signs and wonders, judges and prophets, people who have spoken your word, who have proclaimed your vision for creation, who have taught us again and again to see with new eyes. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, holy, holy, holy God, our life, our mercy, our strength, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Praise and glory to our God who saves us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus who revealed to us your face, your nature, your love. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when your kingdom was emerging within us and among us and through us. He saw those who had been outcast and invited them to the feast. He healed those who had been kept outside the circle and lifted up the humble and the lowly. He ate with all and taught us to see in each person the image of God, the belovedness of Christ, and the movement of the Holy Spirit. On the night before Jesus died, he shared a meal with his friends. After taking bread, he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Even when we are broken, God blesses us, bless, blesses us with nourishment and new life. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took up the cup, which, um, and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. As the covenants of old were sealed with blood, so my life's energy and love have been poured out as a sign of a new covenant of forgiveness and healing available to all. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering of love as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup Make them be for us the body and, and love of Christ, visible signs of your invisible grace, a sacred mystery that we carry with us that unites us with you, with Christ, and with each other as we pour ourselves out in love to proclaim your good news throughout the world. Through your beloved child, Christ, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, all loving God, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite you all now to join in sharing this joyful meal. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Help us to feel the healing power of Christ in our lives, to overcome our fears and our prejudices, our missed opportunities, and all the things that hold us back. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, it's time to dig a hole in the roof. A time for the unexpected, for the unprecedented. Yes, be a friend who takes a friend to Christ. But stir up some dust, too, and make our church a better place to welcome all. Be safe. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you in all that you do. Amen.